What if you could help others to find the power to heal themselves, physically, emotionally, and spiritually? When I started teaching my classes, it was in 2002, and I was just doing the past life regressions and contacting the subconscious part. But then as the time went on and we found how powerful this was and what we could do with it, a lot of the students began saying, you know, advanced past life regression doesn't really tell what it's all about. This is so much more than that. We think you should change the name. So it was a few years ago, we decided to change the name to Quantum Healing Hypnosis Technique. And this is the healing technique that we've now been teaching it, well, since 2002, that's 12 years. What if you could time travel with them? Visit mythical places or angelic realms, other worlds, other galaxies. Help others to speak to their higher selves. You can. Dolores has taught thousands of people from across the world how to use QHHT and now you can learn her method by going directly to DoloresCannon.com and don't forget to mention the discount code MORETALKS. Hi guys and welcome back to another episode of the Kevin Moore Show. Now my guest today is Dr. Stephen Farmer. Now Stephen is a best-selling author, licensed psychotherapist, shamanic healer, ordained minister and former college professor. Now he joins me to discuss his latest book, Animals, Personal Tales of Encounters with Spirit Animals. Dr. Stephen Farmer, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're welcome, Kevin. Thanks for having me on the show. Yes, I well, I hope I can do this justice um, because uh, there's a there's a lot to this. Um, I'm I'm gathering um, by just having a look at the book as well. Uh, this is going to be based on your latest book, which is uh, Animals: Personal Tales of Encounters with Spirit Animals. Um, but this isn't your first uh, book. How many books have you done, Stephen? Oh, I lose count, Kevin, to be quite frank with you. Um, I did books uh, many years ago. I've got about four books that I wrote, published as a psychotherapist, which I continue to have a license as a psychotherapist in California. And uh, there was a period of uh, sort of a fallow period for several years where I didn't write. And then I was introduced um, to uh, shamanism, and that sort of set the spark for what has been an ongoing uh, process of publishing not only books that are related to shamanism, but also um, something called oracle cards, which are uh, kind of like tar like a user-friendly tarot cards is the way a lot of people can relate to it. So I think I've got about, um, probably have published close to about a dozen books and five, well, actually six different Oracle cards, Oracle card decks. So I've been really blessed to be able to do something like that and offer to the world uh, my service and uh, my purpose, really. You are a licensed uh, psychotherapist still. And um, <laughs> what is a psychotherapist, just for those who may not know? Well, a psychotherapist is a counselor, a healer, um, there's a number of um, trainings I've had as a psychotherapist, particularly in trauma, as I mentioned to you prior to the show, uh, not only understanding trauma, which has become a very, very big topic these days, thank God, to understand how when one is traumatized, uh, the residual effects of that uh, traumatic experience or experiences, ongoing experiences in childhood particularly, but even beyond that. But more importantly is there's methodologies, psychotherapeutic methodologies that have uh, uh, come up uh, in the last several years that are really, really effective. You know, that can help people recover from, um, oh, I, you know, signs of trauma, recurring nightmares, you know, agitation, startled, you know, getting startled, very, those kind of things. And um, then shamanism came along and that's a ancient ancient healing practice you know when we were tribal 
which is still exists today, there was typically a go-to person in the community or the tribe that would be the um, psychiatrist, the herbalist, uh, the soul healer, etc. And the gift of the shaman is uh, is and was the capacity to move into this altered uh, alternate reality, non-ordinary reality, and their work with helping spirits. That then would he would he or she would bring that back to the community for healing, whether it's for an individual, a family, or the the tribe itself, or these days even the planet <laughs> in our relationship with the planet, which has been kind of screwy for many thousands of years and is fortunately being revised and remembered. I think you've got an interesting past. I can, I, I get that feeling. Obviously, you know, you've been on a journey and um, I almost want to just ask you, I mean, is there any way that you could summarize the, the journey that you've been on real, real quickly? Yeah, I, I uh, grew up uh, close to where you live in Iowa, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, of all places, you know, until I was 12, moved to California. A really pretty shy kid, uh, kind of weird, a little bit, um, you know, distant from others because uh, I, I just felt different in so many ways. And I think probably there's a lot of kids and teenagers particularly that feel that. Um, so um, I, I, as I went through school, um, I didn't really focus on school so much. I was an athlete, etc. Anyway, one thing jumped into another. I uh, went to, uh, got my master's in um, psychology. Uh, PhD in psychology uh, eventually and um, I was pretty good at uh, the therapy I had a full practice you know it was it was uh, apparently as effective people the, the test was people kept showing up you know and uh, for my services so I think it's pretty good and frankly psychotherapy is a lot about listening not the only thing but you know really listening with empathy you know, to the, uh, the client. And then uh, when shamanism came along, I, I, fe I felt itchy at some point in my life. This is about 20, 20 plus years ago, where I said, okay, what else is there? And then by, you could call it circumstance, coincidence, you know, whatever you want to call it, or you could call it uh, um, God or spirits way of uh, saying, okay, Stephen, come on, you're ready for the next step. Um, a friend of mine gave me a book called Way of the Shaman by um, Michael Harner, who has uh, died just a few years ago, but significantly the person, I believe, that brought shamanism into contemporary culture. I don't pretend I'm a shaman, by the way. I'm a shamanic practitioner. I don't claim that. There are people in the world who are actually shamans. But uh, a lot of us have, have uh, taken on uh, the practices, the principles, etc., of shamanism and be able to apply it again to the individual family community. Anyway, when I, uh, Kevin, when I went through what was a two day introductory course taught by Michael Harner, Way of the Shaman, the, right, the author of Way of the Shaman, and also the founder, along with his wife, of the Foundation for Shamanic Studies. So he created a whole foundation. Uh, man, I'll tell you, I, I, <laughs> I left that two-day course going, okay, this is it. You know, I could feel it. I feel it right now, like prickles on my, the back of my, my skin. It changed the direction of um, my work, basically. And uh, I remember going up to Michael going, what do I do next? You know, can I do the three-year program? You know, he had a three-year advanced job. He mostly I had to kind of you know, rein me in because I was so, uh, and I'm obsessive. I can be a very obsessive and it's not a disorder. Most of the time it's not a disorder. And uh, anyway, I, I took off. It just took off. It grabbed me. So I started taking trainings and classes and other kinds of things and very, a variety of shamanic approaches. Uh, some, again, that are very ancient. Tibetan shamanism, Celtic shamanism, which has been lost along the way. And fortunately, there are people that are retrieving the the teachings there, uh, Huna, Hawaiian shamanism. I mean, there's there's different brands, you could say, from different cultures. But I took all this training and basically retired my uh, psychotherapy practice for a period of time and moved very much into doing shamanic healing. Now, related to the book, uh, and I'm just going to show, you know, the book, Animals. Uh, related to this book, um, and it, it, my path has led me to this book, and I trust beyond this. Uh, 
in my in my period of time where I didn't write or didn't publish anything back when as a psychotherapist, there was about a 10 year gap. And then when I found shamanism, I found there are certain elements or aspects of shamanism that people could relate to whether they give a, a hoot about shamanism. You know, uh, example would be um, uh, animals and spirit animals. You know, when you, you talk to somebody who's not familiar with shamanism uh, and talking about spirit animals, that it, it there's kind of a switch that turns on, you know, which I like because it is one aspect of what I think is happening right now, which is a real interest, Kevin, in returning to a more specific or a different kind of relationship with the natural world. Not just our pets, but animals that we might typically think of as wild animals. You know, coyotes, hawks, um, other kinds of birds, you know, that, that exist in the natural world, four-legged creatures. More so than the animal, not just the animals, but how can they and how are they conveying messages to us? Just like the clouds, in a sense, can convey messages and uh, it, the non-visible beings, you know, that we might associate with archangels, ancestors, etc., that really are helping us along the path. So anyway, I took off with shamanism, took off with started writing. I wrote a book called Sacred Ceremony in that series. That was the first of that genre which was basically saying, you know, yeah, you don't have to care about shamanism or anything like that. You know, you just don't have to even understand what it means to really get the idea that there's ways to do ceremonies that honor the passages. And I'll give you some simple ones. Birthday. You know, it's a birthday and it's a ceremony. It, it uh, weddings, funerals, etc. But ceremonies that carry that that the driving force of the sacred, you know, that they're treated with sacredness, and that it could be religious, but it it encompasses such a broader field than religion. You know, it's it's a more how would I say more basic kind of a spiritual approach, and also encouraging us to remember. So anyway, um, I wrote uh, power uh, sacred ceremony, power animals, uh, animal spirit guides. <laughs> And then what I mentioned to you before the show, the oracle cards, which are kind of a user-friendly tarot, uh, messages from your animal spirit guides, power animals, children's spirit animal guides, or children's spirit animal cards, you know, which has been a hot seller. You know, kids love them, and uh, parents love to see them as well. And uh, that led to uh, earth magic. And then I started working uh, in the field of an ancestors, you know, how to work with ancestors, etc. So... It's been this whole very guided path along here up to leading up to and including this new book called Animals, Personal Tales of Encounters with Spirit Animals. What actual abilities do you have? What gifts do you have? And when did they start coming in as well? And how does it work for you? Could you explain that? At all? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I think it was more, um, how would I put it, structural initially. And what I mean by that, Kevin, that's a really good question. I, I'm not sure where there was a starting point exactly. Um, I think that I was very, I, I, I know from childhood on, I've always been very sensitive. Uh, that's part of my protection as a child, you know, was to be more distant than withdrawn. I understand that now to, to pull in and just be an observer. I grew up in a crazy family, you know, uh, <laughs> probably 90% of us could say that, you know. <laughs> And the listeners are going, yeah, I know what he's talking about here. Um, I say crazy and God love them. You know, I'm, I'm done. I, I'm, I feel done with my parents. You know, they did what they could and I really don't have a energy on it, but it was an alcoholic family, you know, and there were crazy fighting that was going on. Um, and I, as many people do, you just adapt to that. Whatever your adaptations are, it's not thought out. It's instinctual. So my adaptation was, because I was very empathic, very sensitive, my adaptation was to just pull back, you know, and become a good observer. Okay, I can see pot, dad's coming in the room and I can smell the alcohol. Oh, here we go. Okay, I'm going to go to my room, you know, and hide out, that kind of thing. But the gift in that was I became very uh, good at, at picking up on signs and cues from others. So it was training, if you will, <laughs> to 
to go into the psychotherapy. It was natural. I, it, it was more not a conscious calling, but I, it was like being called to do this. This yeah, is where you're, you're destined working. to do it. Yeah, 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 destined. Yeah, destined to do it. Soul's destiny. So um, that was um, it, it, my understanding. Now is that, that just the way I adapted and out of my uh, soul's karma, you could say in a way. Also, that's what I was destined for. Now I didn't really uncover that till much later after I went through school and college and got my license and everything just naturally and set up a practice that oh, this is pretty good stuff, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay with it. And then, like I said, it led me ultimately over several years of this practice. So in addition to taking a lot of trainings, uh, particularly in the latter part of my career as a therapist in that, in that period, uh, doing a lot of work with trauma and trauma recovery. And again, now there's a lot of information on it and people should look it up and partake of it. Um, so what I, I would call, um, you could call it intuitive. I think that's a, a good word for it, is being able to sense, you know, what's going on with this individual you know, or with this group, you know, being able to walk into a room and just get a sense of the atmosphere or the energy of the room, the energy of the group and uh, accepting it and allowing it to develop, I think is, is really what happened uh, to where now uh, I have a way that I've learned over the years to just, oh, okay. That butterfly that landed on my nose. Okay, from one perspective, it's a butterfly landing on my nose. Wow, isn't that cool? And that's valid. Absolutely. I mean, what a trip that would be. Yeah, well, I was in Peru. That actually happened. Butterfly landed on my nose and sat there. So these days now, because I'm known for this, is um, not only is it a butterfly, but another perspective is that it's a message is from it's a message or the uh, conveying a message from spirit in that form, the form being a butterfly. So Kevin, let me throw a question to you. You know, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but if you don't mind, when you think of butterfly, what do you think of? You know, it's just anything. It's not, I'm not looking for a right answer. Are you willing to go with that? I don't know. I have no idea. I don't think I don't I don't think about stuff like that. But it's okay. If I was to think of a butterfly, I would think it's a, it's a nice. It's it's pretty. That's <laughs> probably about it. There you go. Okay, yeah. let's start with that. You know, there's some beauty. Okay, so that's good one. <laughs> that counts. You know, that's 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 why I said I apologize. I didn't mean to put it's you right. on the spot. It's okay. It's okay. But it, it is a different way of thinking, or more accurately perceiving. You know, the world and a butterfly. Yeah, there's something quite beautiful about it. So maybe the message might be, I need to um, bring more beauty into my life, to appreciate beauty more. You see the connection between what you, you, you recognized as a uh, characteristic of the butterfly. The second thing, maybe, and these are all maybes, you know, I, I don't know what the message is going to be until I tune in, but possibility might be, uh, where does the butterfly come from? It comes from this worm. <laughs> you know, or caterpillar of the worm family, but a caterpillar that crawls into this space called a cocoon and goes through a metamorphosis. And wow, what a difference, you know, in the body, <laughs> in the way that it travels, etc. from butterfly, uh, excuse me, from uh, caterpillar to butterfly. We could call that transformation or big changes. You know, that's another possibility that could be the message that's coming by this messenger, the butterfly. So on your website, you offer therapeutic consultation, uh, virtual consultation, spiritual mentoring. Um, and I'm thinking, okay, the spiritual mentor in life coaching. So he's got to be tuning in somehow. He's got to be. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, let's see. There's, there's a few different ways I could respond to that. Uh, specifically related to what's the mentoring program is um, for lack of a better title I gave it spiritual mentoring and life coaching is people come to me uh, probably because they've come across my books or an online uh, presentation or YouTube or you know any of those vehicles and go what's this guy up to you know what how can he help me 
um, uh, in my life purpose, you know, to, to provide the service that I want to provide. Whether yeah, I've had people, I've had animal communicators come to me, people that want to develop a practice. Uh, so I've had people internationally in uh, various parts of the world, you know, uh, European countries, Russia, uh, Australia, you know, a number of places like that, they can reach me through this wonderful vehicle of, of the internet and online. So I feel very, very blessed to be able to do that is basically I establish what are your goals? You know, what do you want to work on here? Well, I've, I'm an animal communicator, but I want to set up a practice. Okay, great. I can help you do some strategizing with that, for instance. Another would be, I want to develop my intuitive skills. Okay, let's start with some exercises here. Or I've had these experiences and I want to uh, be able to have more of them. These experiences where I receive guidance, you know, from signs and omens and different things, or in what we're talking about here in animals coming to me in these unusual ways. And I'm really attracted to it. I've read a couple of your books and so I want to learn more. Great. Okay. Then that would be spiritual mentoring. Another aspect of the practice is a uh, one-to-one -one shamanic healing, or I would call it, um, I mentioned that, you know, I, I am a psychotherapist. And I did a tremendous amount of training as a therapist and then a lot of training as a shamanic practitioner. What I noticed in about four or five years ago is I can really blend those two. Some people, it might not be, be too weird, you know, to shamanic healing. So we'll do hypnosis. Okay. Uh, nail biting, a teenager comes in, 15 years old, wants to get rid of her nail bite. Okay, good. Let's do hypnosis. Boom. Done. You know, so I've got a variety and people can go to the website and look all that stuff up or inquire or check with my assistant uh, and business manager, Jessica, as to what well, can he help me with this? You know, and some people I would go, nah, I'm going to refer you to somebody else, you know, that uh, that is more suitable for what you're needing. So that's kind of a quick sweep of uh, the teaching and the healing services I provide. So I know it's a little confusing at times because I've got so much going on. You know, I've got these books and these oracle cards and I do oracle card readings uh, and I do healing and I do mentorship, you know. So I got a whole bag full, but I got the gray hair to prove it, Kevin, you know. <laughs> well, I, I will have one day. I will have one day, brother. Don't do that. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned there the the readings with the uh, the the oracle deck of cards. How is that working for you? How what, what is that session all about? This is from the Earth Magic Oracle cards, and I also have um, um, actually new ones just came out uh, called Messages from the Ancestors Oracle cards. In addition to three others, and another one on the way. They're e they're friendly. They're easy to use. And there's a guidebook that comes with it, like the Earth Magic cards. Um, and uh, messages so it gives you very specific instructions about how to how to use these cards and in a way it's like uh, uh, earth magic for instance uh, spirit speaks through these cards in a way you know depend but you gotta like I said there's some guy uh, the guidebook gives you um, ways to work with them but it might be something like I'll call that stone people vigilante uh, ancestors generations you know, the, so the people tune into the images, uh, whale breach. For instance, this is a good one, you know, is people, co excuse me, people pull this card, you know, when they're doing a reading for themselves or someone else. And breach is when, uh, is the metaphor of when a whale breaches the surface of the water. So the metaphor then becomes uh, a message to whoever pulls this card that it's time to do something completely different, you know, I get out of the water, <laughs> you know, jump through the skin of the water, you get it, you know, that's, that becomes then a metaphor and often spirit speaks in metaphors like that. Uh, lotus flower unfoldment, for instance, you know, that says, oh, this is really a time of flowering. And also, interestingly enough, motor, uh, lotus flower uh, closes every night, uh, and goes into the mud. So this elegant, beautiful, magical flower comes up from the mud. Again, a metaphor. You know, in the darkest times, there's a gift that's that's sort of uh, gestating. <laughs> and that gift isn't showing itself yet until it comes into the light. 
So those are readings or what what type you, of when you card. hold those cards and when you're doing that uh, reading for someone, what do you think you're connecting to at a deeper level? Uh, wow. I think that it's um, the spirit that I am. This uh, is kind of an abstract way to say that, but it's connecting uh, to my own intuitive process. That's a simpler way to say it. So that I'm, I'm also, just like I said, but also if you just kind of deduce, you know, the butterfly. The butterfly flits around, okay? Well, maybe you're flitting around too much, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's time to land, you know, whether it's on the nose, <laughs> using your senses, you know, whatever. You can, but you deduce it from the characteristics of the visitor. Okay, then let me ask you this then. So when you're in a session yeah. with someone, do you feel sometimes that messages just come to you and you'll, someone Absolutely. will pop in and then you'll give that? Because I've seen you in being interviewed by someone else and you gave this rapid answer on something that you were getting this other person to intuition, intuitively sort of tune into. And I was like, that guy's, th this guy's tuned, really tuned in. And, and uh, th that's what I'm trying to get to in this interview because, you know, I, I know this is about the book, but, but you know, how do you, how did you come up with this book? Do you know what I mean? Where, where are you pulling this information from? Well, uh, the information when I'm doing, an, let's say, an Oracle card reading, I don't do, uh, well, I do sometimes, but I don't advertise that I do psychic readings or that I'm a psychic. You know, I just don't because there's other people that do a much better job at it than myself. Uh, some very gifted people, and that's their path. That's their. So, in answer to your question, uh, yes, I, I would consider it a psychic process. You know, I, I like the word intuitive. I think more people can relate to that. But yes, it's also been practiced, uh, Kevin, over years and years, you know, of practice that has become refined. And I'll tell you, there's, there's a couple of key words with it. Trust what you get. And that's your discernment as well, isn't it? In a, in a yeah, sense. it's yeah. what you see in your mind's eye or what something comes to you in the midst of a reading out here. Spirit works in all, you know, both inside and out. And, and what I feel, my sensations in my body. A lot of people are out of body, you know, are dissociated from the bodily sensations or the awareness of those. And that's one of my pitches is get acquainted with your body and how your body, you know, maybe tightens up or there's a gut feeling or, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, what I what I hear, I'm often I get messages from the inner voice. You know, I have my wife. <laughs> my wife gave me a shirt. Kevin, you'll, you'll appreciate this. I am a writer in bold letters. And underneath it says, I make the voices I hear in my head work for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do appreciate that, actually. Yeah, yeah, that it's true. Funny. It's true. I, I listen to the voices in my mind, you know. Yeah, but and you, and you've learned to trust that. Like, as you said there, you know, when something comes to you, you've learned to just, you know, regardless of what it may mean, nothing to you, to the person you're giving the reading yeah. to, it could mean everything, especially for validation as well. Yeah. And do you, do you, think, you're you're work, right. do you think you're working for a, uh, is there a, group you're working with or team, do you think you're working with a guide that's the kind of like at, at the background there somewhere or that's no, good no it's another you're asking some good questions that's why you got this job that you're doing oh uh, the good question yeah um the, there's this what we could call god or great spirit or source or universe you know different people use different terms for it they're just words i like great spirit or the great mystery is another one you know, the ones that, you know, people, humans have grappled with for millennia. Um, so there's that. But great spirit or spirit expresses in different forms, both non-visible and visible. That tree out there is a tree, but it's also spirit expressing as a tree. This human being here tagged uh, Dr. Stephen Farmer or Stephen as the case may be, or Doc Stephen, I'm liking more and more lately. It's, it's not, uh, people say, well, it's spirit, it's, uh, spirit, uh, we're human beings. Uh, I don't know, I, I always forget to say, human, no, uh, human beings have a spirit. spiritual experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is spirit embodied. That's a different take. It takes away from that duality, you know, of, oh, it's spirit inside me, and oh, it's a human being, too. You've heard it before, but I, I want to say, oh, no. Let's try a different take here. I am spirit. Just happen to be in physical form at this point. But there are also non-visible beings, people who have had reported uh, experiences, many, many experiences of having a dream about a deceased loved one. 
you know, feeling a, a deceased beloved cat jumping on the bed <laughs> and feeling the bounce. You know, the, the message is from the afterlife, for instance. You mentioned their healing as well. What is the healing process that you do as well for people that want to come to you for healing? Yeah, I, I'd like to say one more thing about that, that other question that I'll give you that. Um, and because I think it's such a big thing, and this came up in an interview recently too, imagination. What we tend to think of as imagination, and I think there is that perspective that's legitimate, is uh, make-believe, fantasy, you know, children playing, you know, whatever. But I want to take a, another perspective on imagination. It's the bridge to the spirit world, or a better way to say it, yeah, is imagination takes us into this alternate reality. Well, you know, it's funny you say that. Some people say, you know, the more I feel I get past that stage of I'm making it up, I'm, and then even if I do go into a semi-makeup belief state, then getting past that state, something connects. And it's something that's way beyond making it up. It's then you've connected with something, but you have to get into that state, don't you, to get through the well door. Stated. Well said. Well said. Yeah, you go into an altered state of consciousness. That's in a way, it's a big deal and it's not a big deal. You know, we do that all the time. You ever space out? Daydream, that's an altered state. Hypnosis, you work in an altered state of consciousness. That's why the girl could heal her nail biting. Right, which is, uh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's what, as you say, hypnosis is. So I, well said, yeah. It, it helps to um, practice things like meditation, you know, being able to access these the, these different states of consciousness where, for instance, the brain actually, the brain waves actually slow down. Uh, we absolutely, absolutely. And it's almost like that greater part opens up and uh, the, the funnel just opens up, doesn't it? And it allows that greater part of you, the true the true you, come to come through. Did you find that in your hypnosis sessions sometimes? Did you ever sort of delve into some weird cases in, in your hypnosis sessions where people were going oh, beyond yeah, this I... understanding sometimes or? Yeah, I, that has happened. I, I don't recall any specific story right now, but uh, hypnosis is great. You know, the, in the right hands, I think it can be used for uh, for healing purposes. Again, that one simple example I mentioned, but others. Uh, meditation is great because it slows your brain down. And when your brain slows down, meaning the, you know, measured by the EEG, um, it, it opens you to a different kind of experience. When people say in my workshops, I do a process or an exercise, I guide them through it, and I ask for feedback, you know, comments, you know, what you experience, and the person will raise their hand and say, I don't know if this is, ha but it, I think, how is it not, just, it's just my imagination, right? And I say, I say, of course it's your imagination, that's what takes you there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, I'm breaking past that, that's right. And what is your website as well, Stephen? Sure, it's DR, like Dr. Stephen Farmer, and that's with a V, Stephen Farmer. Uh, dot com. Dot com. Thank you. That's been coming up on the screen throughout the, uh, the uh, chat that we just had so far. And and look, we were I was trying to say to you, you know, what what is the healing side? So the healing side. So if someone feels that they, whether it's physical healing or emotional healing, do you do both with your work? Is there a sort of if someone's got some sort of physical condition and they feel attracted or pulled to want to come see you, would you are your doors open? Absolutely. And what I may do is incorporate a team. You know, in other words, uh, I might suggest, uh, uh, you know, first go get checked out, you know, do some lab work, go to your doctor, get some lab work done. We want to be able to identify if there is a specific physical condition that would be a uh, um, physical problem that's contributing to whatever it's expressed, however it's expressing in the body. And then go to work, you know, and I do my thing. Somebody I might say, look, you need more nurturing, go get a massage, you know, or yeah, you want a psychic reader? Okay, great. I'll send you to somebody. I've got a couple of good names for you. So I don't feel like I'm the one to go to always. What is your common, what's a common type of healing that you do for people that come to you for healing? What's the sort of common sort of? There is one healing process that I think is just blows my mind, a shamanic healing process called soul retrieval. It's a, now you got to understand it's a different paradigm, but it works. What happens, and again, from this perspective, there's other things that from another perspective that happen when one is traumatized, especially unhealed trauma. <clears throat> but the take shamanically, from the shamanic perspective, what happens when somebody is um, traumatized 
there's a part of us that leaves. And it could be a fragmentation of the soul. It's considered, that's how I consider it. It's, oh, the soul has been fragmented. It's experienced psychologically as a, a dissociation, feeling out of body, often described that way. I don't feel like I'm here, <laughs> that sort of thing. What happens often is that aspect or that uh, piece or that fragment of the soul can return, you know, to rejoin the overall soul. However, what happens sometimes for uh, any number of reasons is the soul remains in this non-ordinary reality, you know, in this other place, this other dimension, you could say. So my job would be, and I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but basically uh, interviewing the person, et cetera, et cetera, having them lie down. And then uh, my job is with the help of my spirit guides, which by the way are spirit animals, I'm taken to that soul piece and I do some persuasion, negotiating, et cetera, to see if they're willing to come back. And then I bring them back and I install them in the person and then give them instructions from there. Like I said, that's a very condensed, uh, it gives you a kind of a map of what soul retrieval is, soul loss and soul retrieval. And I find it's very effective. You know, I'd say probably 80% of the people that I've worked with in that way, they really uh, find there are significant changes that ensue from the soul retrieval. That's a, for instance, another, is, well, another one from the psychotherapy side or still a little mystical, but it's something called somatic experiencing or somatic therapy. And that's working with the way the body has frozen in different parts due to the trauma and has remained frozen. So what we want to do is kind of slowly and gradually unfreeze that. And I do mean gradually. Uh, as an example, or EMDR, we use eye movements, finger taps, etc., which is a very effective process for trauma recovery. So you get my point, though. There's different methodologies. Um, I love the idea that trauma is being studied more, and there are technologies, you know, um, psycho spiritual technologies that are showing up and have been showing up that are ex really effective. So I want to say to your listeners, you don't need to suffer. You know, you've suffered long enough with the residuals of the trauma. So you seek out a good professional to work with, you know, in any of these modalities. Thank you for that. Uh, that's a, a fascinating about the uh, soul retrieval. I mean, to get my sure. head around something like that, I'm, I'm not going to because that is uh, way beyond my, my pay grade. But um, just, just the, <laughs> the, 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 the idea that aspects of one's soul can leave and almost going into a hiding and it's almost like it's uh, allowing you to get on with what you've got to do without uh, that part affecting you um, whatever that is that's that's incredible uh, and you're able to pull that pull that back uh, fascinating now obviously we're going to get into your book as well um, and uh, but if someone wanted to come see you in regards to their spirit animal um, or to get a deeper connection with their spirit animal what reading would that come under um, sure and again uh this is the book we're talking about, the animals book. Uh, these are, uh, in addition to what I've offered in this book, I'm the featured author, but there's several stories, 27 of them, I think, of people who've had encounters. Uh, one thing that helps to understand is that there, there are, you know, again, I can give interpretations uh, of what the message might be, etc. In one of my books, Animal Spirit Guides, that's what's there. You turn to, you know, out of 200 animals, you turn to, let's say, Fox, you know, and okay, Fox shows up in my dream. What's that mean? You know, and there's a possible meanings. You know, it could be more discretion, need for more discretion, you know, pull back, you not being visible, etc. for a while. You got to be a little craftier. You see the, you hear the metaphors? <laughs> Are you actually able to ever tune in to the animal, um, whether it's on a dream state or whether it's in this reality? Are you, are you ever, do, do you think you're tuning into something that's connected with what they've seen in some other altered state or even in this reality and that's bringing the information through do you ever consider what how that's working yes oh yeah absolutely and again it's a way of explaining it is that animal is being sent by spirit to give you a message period but you're able yeah. to, to decode it i'm asking you where is that decoding coming from it's the same thing as what we've said earlier on it's this you're connecting with your 
animal guides. Yeah, I, I generally, uh, good, uh, I'll, I'll go real quickly. There's four possible ways to discern the message or interpret the message of the animal. And again, uh, I don't know why I keep landing on coyote because there's coyotes around here in the neighborhood. We've got a couple of ravines and such. But one is look it up. Look it up in one of the books, you know, my book or other books. You know, see if you can find that coyote and see what coyote spirit might be saying to you. Um, second, the Internet. Go to do a search on the Internet. It says coyote spirit animal, coyote power animal, coyote totem animal, coyote animal spirit guy. You know what? Try some different meat and see what, what I tell people. See which one clicks. You know, you feel what I call I like the term resonance. So that's that's one way. The third is what I mentioned about the butterfly deduction, you know, analysis. OK, analyze or look it up and find out the characteristics of the animal. And you can deduce from those characteristics as a metaphor what the message might be. And fourth, and this is where it gets fun, Kevin. And this is what I like people to do eventually. Tune into the spirit animal that has sent a representative to you. Butterfly. And this is what I suggest. Silently and telepathically, you send the message or coyote spirit. What's your message? And then my teaching is pay attention to whatever happens right after you ask the question what you see what you hear what you feel and again back to what we spoke of earlier trust what you get it'll either make complete sense to you right then or you go what the heck i don't know what that means you know and you got to kind of let it simmer for a while and work you so let's just go into the book then so part one of the book is understanding spirit animals so right. um Okay, what are spirit animals then, just very briefly? Sure. Uh, spirit animals are any animal that presents itself to you in an unusual way or repetitively, whether the physical animal or a symbol of the animal, like in dreams, like on a poster, like on the side of a semi truck, you know, where there's an image of that animal. That's what a spirit animal is. Uh, to cap that off, it's, uh, I, I, I totally believe this and actually know this in my heart of hearts. Spirit, in many, many ways, offers guidance. And the guidance comes through different ways. And one of the vehicles certainly is animals. So that's the kind of purpose of it, in a sense. And do you think there's any purpose or connection with our own pets as well? Do you think uh, they serve as our spirit animals, or would you not connect our own personal pets with, with your work? Absolutely. Um, the, the, what I would look for in, let's say, I've got two dogs. We have two dogs, two cats. So we have two desert tortoises. We have two chickens. <clears throat> what I might look for, uh, something out of the ordinary. You know, the dog is behaving differently. And so then I would say, send my message or send my inquiry to the dog. What's going on? You know, give me some clues here. And again, what I see, what I hear, what I feel in response to my question, my inquiry. So, yeah, I, I give it a try with pets, you know, absolutely. So um, spirit animals certainly can be. The other type of spirit animal, get this one, Kevin, is after, let's say, your favorite uh, grandmother dies. You're sitting out having a cup of tea on the patio and suddenly a dove flies down and lands on the table and you know without knowing why you know ah that's a messenger from grandma and then you start crying or you know whatever i cannot tell you how many times i've heard stories like that a woman who uh lost her father her father died and she's walking along the beach and there is this is a very unusual way that a dolphin will do this but the dolphin was tracking her and she knew without knowing why hear that she knew without knowing how she knew or why she knew she knew that was a messenger from her father which is another aspect of spirit animals right okay and we've all got a personal spirit animal do you feel yeah, um, there's another term I've just brushed on briefly, uh, two other terms, power animal and totem animal. Um, yeah, totem animal is usually a, a, a spirit animal that's shared by a group, a community, or a clan. Like, a, let's say a, a certain group might adopt a spirit animal. 
and that becomes that group's totem animal, so all of them are able to relate to it. Power animal comes from shamanism, but again, it's not the exclusive domain of shamanism, and that's a particular spirit animal that um, you you may have been aware of, you know, for over a period of time, or someone like myself or a shamanic practitioner can fi help you find that particular spirit animal. That's called a, called a power animal. So it's a long term relationship. You know, it's one that you you probably know or have a sense already of what your power animal is, or you can just start putting the question out to the universe and say, okay, what is my spirit animal and watch who shows up over the next few weeks and look for repetition. So yeah, that's called a power animal. Do you think some pets that we have um, have been a power animal or have been a spirit guides in, in past lives and that maybe um, we're back again, but just in different uh, roles, I suppose. Uh, this is a good, uh, no, you ask good questions, Kevin. <laughs> One, power animals, because of the nature of what a power animal is, can only be animals of the wild, you know, that are connected to the wild in some way. Because again, it, we're, we're beginning to relate in a different way to the natural world, into a way that was familiar to our long ago ancestors. Whereas uh, spirit guides, absolutely. You know, a deceased uh, pet can absolutely be a spirit guide, an animal spirit guide. Uh, a living pet can be an animal spirit guide, like we, like we mentioned earlier, uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, but I want to think. I want you to think. Uh, uh, all of the listeners think of power animal as the one particular animal. And yes, you can have more than one. But let's not get 157 power animals. That's not the point. You know, all you really need is one, maybe two. You know, to navigate. They help you navigate through this lifetime. Uh, wolf is one of my spirit animals or power animals. It's been with me for 30 years, and I feel completely protected in so many ways. And Wolf has been a great guardian spirit, protecting my family. Uh, and that's, I, I go beyond trust or belief, you know, it's just, I know. And I thank you, Wolf. Thank you again for your constant protection. In your book as well, you've got, you've got a number of personal tales of encounters with spirit animals. And I guess um, it was kind of difficult to uh, choose some of the better ones. But I mean, all these are from... Um, I guess, people on, on your journey that you've met? Well, not necessarily, but uh, the publisher, actually, Ariel, came up with this idea of the series. You notice, I want to show you at the top, where it says Common Sentience. There's actually about eight books in the series of different, um, you could say, uh, stories of mystic. she calls them mystical encounters. I happen to be, she called on me to, to develop this. But again, 27 people have submitted these stories, and that's not the only ones that have been submitted. Those are the ones that made it <laughs> into this book. Uh, very touching stories, too, just in, and some just amazing and some heartfelt and touching. Uh, it, it, it generates the interest in others being able to experience those kind of stories, you know, living stories with spirit animals. And I'm like, yeah, wait, yay, Ariel. What was one of the most sort of touching ones for you then that really, without, well, obviously, because we, 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 we're stuck on time right now, but I mean, what was there to sum up one of those touching stories? Um, I'll try to be brief, uh, Kevin. It was one uh, of an animal communicator. I'm not an animal communicator. I don't consider myself in that role. But there are several people that are just amazing, able to discern what they're, you know, what the animal's trying to communicate. Anyway, it's the story of an animal communicator who was called to this horse that had a tumor. She's also an animal healer called it had a tumor and was, you know, being prepared to be put to rest, to, to be euthanized. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the owner, who was a 15-year-old girl, I think 14 or 15-year-old girl that loved this horse, also um, had a tumor. Uh, the amazing thing that happened when she went to communicate with the horse, she heard the horse communicate, I took it from her. So the, Laura is her name, because uh, in the book, so she doesn't mind my, using the name. And Laura said, what? She was a little puzzled by that. I took it from her, but the horse repeated that communication. And what happened, the girl was cured of her tumor. And the horse took it on, sacrifice. <sighs> Makes me emotional. The horse took it on and sacrificed because of his love 
for her and was euthanized with the tumor and she was completely healed. True story. That is one of the most, that's the lead, that's one of the lead stories. Sure, sure. No, that's a really, yeah, that's a really uh, touching story. Absolutely. You know, I wonder what they think, the animals out there think of uh, what mankind's doing to the world right now uh, and, and the direction <laughs> we're going in. <laughs> that's a good question. I, I think that, um, I think they have a, you know, a sense of it, you know, when fires start and what happens to the animals, they either get out or they don't, you know, that we're in a, an era of deconstruction, you know, or as a colleague in front of us, yeah, uncreating, you know, things are, devolution is another term. There's many terms for that, but it, in a broader sense, it's the evolution of the planet. Four and a half billion years, it's been through six, six extinctions excuse me, five extinctions that we can, has been scientifically proved where a good deal of the life has been wiped out for this reason or that. Everybody thinks about the, the meteor that struck the earth. Yeah, that's one, <laughs> but there've been more and it's possible we're in the process of a sixth extinction. Many species, you know, have, have died, have died out, you know, that don't exist anymore. But again, it's part of the natural evolution. We blame ourselves or humans. Oh, it's, you know, well, yeah, there's some truth in that. But what if we weren't here? It might be going on anyway. You know, global warming might be changing. We don't know. But well, maybe we've you know, we've sped it up, but absolutely. But yeah, yeah. Um, it would have happened anyway. Yeah. My pitch uh, bottom line really is uh, have a spiritual discipline. I don't care what it is. You know, you need to find your heart your love, your compassion through all this, even if you dip into the suffering, the low level anxiety and fear that many people are feeling, you know, m feel it, but move past it, you know, move past it, you know, get, bring something different to the world. Yeah. Recycling. Yeah. Okay. And express your gratitude, express your love. It's an amazing, amazing experience to be alive amazing pause breathe again know that just know that it's a privilege it's not a right it's a privilege yeah there's some of us isn't there that just uh, just don't want to be here that we'd rather it just come to an end because the pain is so much for some people unfortunately that's true kevin yeah and those are the people, maybe we reach them, you know, uh, a kind touch, maybe a hug, you know, those of us in California who hug, <laughs> you know, whatever it may be, or just lend an ear, listen, you know, hear what, hear what they're saying. And more importantly than just humans, if I might add, listen to the animals, listen to the trees, listen to the plants. They are, they're our relatives. We don't get that quite in the... No, no. Well, then how then do people deepen their connection to their spirit animals then? That is, is start practicing some of this, you know, check it out, try it out, try it out. I don't pretend to have the answer. You know, I always say, yeah, be skeptical, but for a while, put that aside. You know, don't believe, don't just believe me and don't disbelieve me, you know, put that aside. Try it out, be a good scientist. You know, what is science? You experiment. Try it as an experiment, okay? When somebody on you, uh, an animal in an unusual way or repeatedly shows up, check it out, see what's going on. Look it up in a book, look it on the internet. One of my friends, he uh, he's constantly um, having deer come come close to him when he's on these nature runs. There's a lot of that he does. You know, they just happen just to always come out in their tribe. <laughs> I'm sure there's a connection there, but that's for him to work out. And, what, what, and this is what your book says about evolving our uh, interrelationship uh, with them as well. And uh, I think I think what you're saying is that if there's any message to come, you'll just know it. It's, it's maybe that wiser voice coming through sometimes when you're in their company or, or in that en energy, yeah. in a sense, as well. Yeah. And also, I would say, uh, ask, hey, what's the message here? What deer spirit? What's the man? Not, not the physical deer, you know. He's he's kind of a sales rep, <laughs> in a way, you know. But the spirit of that deer, and you may find that okay, deer is saying to you, be a little easier on yourself. Or the deer might be saying, hey, it's time to be a little extra vigilant. You know how deer, what they say, deer caught in the headlights. 
Yeah. Yeah, or maybe it's overcoming some sort of fear. That's the message. Or overcome some fear. Yeah, yeah. there's a fear that's or going some on. Emotional yeah. blockage or Good for you, Kevin. Yeah, you got it going, man. <laughs> I'm just looking at the book. It's all right. <laughs> I'm like, oh, look oh, at these examples okay, there. Though. That's yeah. what I suggested. One of the four things to do. Yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you um, so, so much for uh, coming on today. And uh, the book, um, I believe the book is out now. Yes, it is. Just released. Yeah, just, just released. released. Okay, well, we're going to link the book. I mean, the book's been coming up on the screen as well. We're going to link the book in the uh, description of this video. Stephen's. Uh, websites well, website is in the uh, description below and you'll be able to contact him there uh, we've put your uh, services on the screen as well just to show them uh, what you do as well and uh, if there was a final message just right now what do you think that would be for the audience just pay attention you know show up pay attention you know um, see what happens you know especially attending to the world of animals and the animal that comes to you in some weird unusual way or keep showing up again and again and ask, you know, try it out. Like I said, be a good scientist, put your beliefs and beliefs aside. I want to stress that uh, you, you try it out, gang. It's a great way to find uh, a reconnection, a remembrance and a reconnection to the natural world, as well as learning how to receive regular messages from spirit via the animals in a, because they are in an identifiable form and can give you clues that help you on your life path and your purpose. Well, Dr. Stephen, I just uh, want to say to you, thank you so, so much for coming on. And it's been a pleasure to spend this bit of uh, time together. And I wish you all the success for the book and everything that you're doing as well. Thank you. Uh, God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. I appreciate it. And thank you for uh, taking me on here. <laughs>